Okay, so we have talking for the next 30 minutes. Alan Stevo, who is the Chief of Staff at Kraken Exchange, which supports Monero and we have a strong relationship with. And he is also the author of the Bitcoin Manifesto book. So let's give a hand for Alan Stevo, please. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Justin. Hi there. Now, uh, when you zoom the microphone out, when you zoom the microscope out a little, uh, a New York apartment building and a Moroccan rural village, they share the same internet challenges. This would be inefficient methods of distribution across the last mile. And an idea, an idea that we have come up with is to address this inefficiency to provide greater internet availability than user. And this presentation is going to discuss the concept of micropayments with strong privacy protections that address these challenges. And the challenges, the, the, the solutions we're talking about would uh, make, make the question of who can, thank you for that shush back there. We have such a, a rowdy full group here, it's amazing. Um, the idea for this came out of a series of discussions with Peter Runyon, who along with me is available to, to speak further about the idea afterwards, if, if you may be so inclined. Um, today I'm going to present to you a draft from a white paper uh, that we are working on how to deliver internet access across the last mile to uh, users globally. Um, now, to contextualize this, if you turn on an antenna, everyone in this room knows this, if you turn on an antenna or phone or computer in many urban areas around the developed world, and even in undeveloped areas, it's going to show you 30, maybe 40 accessible and publicly identifiable routers. Then there may be other routers that are not publicly identifiable. And very few of these routers reach their capacity uh, each month on their bandwidth allocation. Now, how many people here, how many people, show of hands, please, a little audience participation, how many people have utility service in their homes? Water, gas. Some people are not raising their hands. Maybe they do not have utilities. Maybe they are shy. Um, and how many people have internet access in their homes? I am not trying to social engineer you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now, setting up monthly internet in a home or office is just something people do. And it's considered a cost of living on your own. It's a necessary utility, um, just like having electricity and gas. And electricity and gas are paid for in units rather than as a flat fee. Now, internet users tend to pay with a flat fee. So there's a flat fee for monthly internet, and this is closer to a wholesale model, I would argue, than, uh, than how electricity and natural gas service are handled. And there's, there's an opportunity to make it a little bit more retail. And I think that there's, there's uh, incentive for people to do good, there is incentive for profit, and there's incentive to uh, spread the internet further uh, through local networks, some that do not yet exist. Um, it's often because of a lack of communication between neighbors that this situation can even exist. Um, and if a technology existed that enabled improved communication among neighbors on this topic, then a marketplace would immediately form. So there's a, an issue of communication here. And a little software, a little software in the middle can help neighbors communicate with each other better. It can help with a, a communal aspect of, uh, of uh, sharing the resources we have, if we so desired to, if we felt so incentivized to. I'd like to go through a few of the problems. Because, of, because there's more of a wholesale environment than a retail environment, I'd like to go through a few of the problems that that seemingly simple uh, uh, zoomed out microscope view uh, creates. And in addition to, to access to food, water, and shelter, to be part of the global economy, you need information. And how do you empower people with that information, with that access, and it's, it's through the internet. Um, and internet service is of poor quality and expensive in many areas of the globe. Um, and internet service often does not easily reach the users who want it without significant infrastructure challenges. And we've addressed a few topics as they relate to developing nations. Um, also, developed nations have some other concerns, also shared by some developing nations. This would be ISP throttling, where uh, large enough adoption of a software like the one we describe uh, would allow people to assert direct file transfer 
uh, without the risk of information being slowed by someone who might disagree with the information being transferred. There's privacy concerns. Uh, there's the, the certainty related to that first. There's that certainty that the information is going to r arrive at its intended destination. There's government interference, of course, in determining who has access to what information. Um, and users most often agree uh, to one month or longer contracts rather than bite-sized chunks. And in a developed world, many users will end up using five or 10 gigabytes of internet a month. Um, there's, there's a tremendous amount of room here for software that would encourage uh, some of that excess capacity to be, to be utilized. And to summarize this problem in one sentence, there's residential internet usage continues to exist in a wholesale environment rather than a retail environment. Uh, with the consideration the internet has the ability to change the world, bringing education and work in a world economy to every person in every corner of the globe who wants it, but will have a very hard time doing it if it cannot reach every corner of the globe, on this topic, the words of William Gibson from the early 1990s remain true. The future is already here. It's just not very evenly distributed. Our proposal is a software system to enable a sharing economy for internet usage among people who do not already know each other. And to take this software and to combine it with uh, a useful payment system that would ensure privacy, uh, like Monero, is, is how we envision that. The, the, the software to enable better communication and privacy combined with uh, an ability for users to pay for services they've received, for value they have gotten, and an ability for providers to uh, obtain, obtain payment for the value they have provided to others. Now, expected outcomes of this are places where people want Wi-Fi are going to have Wi-Fi. Um, and this will simply be an, an impact of creating a market environment here through software like this. Um, it doesn't have to be more complicated than simply incentivizing, I believe. Places where people don't want Wi-Fi will not have Wi-Fi. That's another consequence, I believe. Um, this transition will be incentivized to take place virtually overnight in some places. Um, the, the infrastructure largely exists already. The cost will be very low for Wi-Fi customers under this model. Uh, in the market environment, without central, centralization, without regulation, users who desire privacy will incentivize providers to give them the privacy they desire. There will be competition among providers for what to, how to satisfy a consumer. Um, two networks will consequently form, most likely. There will be... Uh, Flow of information through the ISPs. This will be one type of network. There will be a second peer-to-peer -peer network that will likely form where, where no one is going to want to censor. There will be no incentive for anyone to want to censor what you do across that peer-to-peer -peer network. And on top of that, we're likely to see additional applications built. Now, now governments take it upon themselves to perform an array of social good. And many voters expect that behavior. Nonprofits pick up the slack when possible. Many find it impossible to imagine a world any differently than that. Um, the truth is that, that the vast amount of social good, I think many in this room would agree if we, if we discussed it a little, the vast amount of social good and cooperation among strangers takes part in a market environment uh, motivated by profit. It's how we get our food, it's how we get our clothes, and in almost all situations, it's how we get our shelter. It's how we get cars, leisure, and technology. And true to this principle, our, our system will incentivize internet node holders to deliver the internet that last mile. Um, who here has used couch surfing before? Please raise your hand if you've used couch surfing. Cool, a few people. I've used couch surfing, I love it. How many people in this room have used Airbnb? More people, more people. I use Airbnb, I love it. Um, and there's, there's a difference there. There's a difference in between couch surfing and Airbnb. And there's, there's really neat models out there for providing internet. There's uh, uh, Libremesh right now, for example. Really cool concept for, for how uh, to provide internet that last mile. And I think the difference there is perhaps uh, comparable to, to couch surfing and Airbnb, if you compare Libremesh to, to what I'm discussing here. That the ideal is to incentivize the, the provider. Um, some, some retailers exist already, such as Boingo would be an example like that. They provide mobile access to, to consumers using wireless devices, but there's much more, there's much more potential here if, if the uh, software existed for that potential to exist. And there's several impacts of that kind of software I'd like to, to point to for a, a moment or two. What would be an example of 
a network of peers. So the network will eventually connect nodes outside the ISP so that one way to transfer information will be across the network, peer to peer, through wireless connections between nodes, as I, as I described. This, this will have profound implications, that there's no central source to, to throttle internet communication. Um, internet, through, through producers fighting with each other, there's, there's the, the idea that free internet Free internet is what we need. And I don't believe free internet is realistic because of the amount of effort that goes into creating internet access for someone. But it's entirely plausible to imagine nearly free internet. It's entirely plausible to imagine a network that spans the globe and provides nearly free internet. And not, not nearly free internet that someone is going to extract your data from and make you the product, but really truly free internet where you have a private presence on that network. Um, anyone, anyone, of course, who offers free internet should be looked at suspiciously in this era. Uh, certainly everyone in this room understands that, you know, what's wrong with the quality or how many advertisements will I see or who's my data going to be exposed to. And I believe with a technology like this, we're done with the idea of everyone paying 50 to $80 a month for home internet service with virtually no options available in some areas in terms of competition. Um, now, a few use cases. A few use cases here. Uh, a residential apartment building in New York City, for example, maybe not the most the most attractive use case to begin with, but but one that one that is perhaps readily accessible. In that you have you have a three to six unit building. You have a, you can end up in a situation where people are paying maybe fifteen or twenty dollars a month by simply communicating with each other, by simply sharing the internet resources they have. This, this would be kind of a nice advantage. It's not ground, groundbreaking. It's not, it's not that, that impressive, but it's a small change, right? Maybe, maybe you save a, a percentage off your monthly budget, whatever. But to imagine where that can go as you, as you make internet available, as you encourage someone to create a node around their home, as you encourage someone who lives near Times Square, perhaps, to create a node, and what that suddenly means for internet usage in a, a public space, and what that competition means as we suddenly enter into a place like New York City where we suddenly have 10,000 or 20,000 people becoming an ISP effectively, and what that could mean to the marketplace, how disruptive it could be, and how, how uh, sad how sad the telecommunications companies might be when an individual suddenly has a little bit more leverage against them. Another example might be a rural U.S. downtown. You know, we can imagine that, that for three years the mayor has been promising in a rural U.S. downtown that he's going to try to get Wi-Fi in an upstate New York area, and he's not feeling motivated, so Jane, who owns the coffee shop, make sure that her Wi-Fi is up and running whenever a customer wants to use it. Um, but Jane also doesn't feel incredibly motivated about it, and she lets it go down from time to time. Jane implements her software. By the end of May, perhaps Jane ends up with 80 new people paying 5 to $10 a month for a little bit of internet access here and there when they're visiting. And they have reliable internet access. They have fast internet access. Because Jane, making maybe $500 a month now, suddenly has a new source of revenue and a, suddenly has an incentive to, to make sure that internet is great. So she hires a local college student to come by and look at the router every two weeks. Maybe she pays him $75 a month. She's still making profit and uh, gives him a few free coffees. Here, here it becomes a little bit more interesting where we're, where we're building more access for people who do not have access. And uh, couch surfing once, I had the pleasure of staying with with a, a gentleman and his family in, in Morocco. Uh, and theirs was the last town right before the Atlas Mountains. And his father was, I don't know, maybe 70 years old and blind. And he was the man who went to, to go into the mosque to uh, announce the call for prayer five times a day. Um, and th this gentleman, Muhammad, he ran a little, he ran a little uh, kiosk where he'd sell these made in China uh, phone cases. And Muhammad would be a, a perfect example for me of where, where this technology would suddenly begin to, begin to make a real difference. Um, because around his phone case store, there was kind of a buzz. People would come around and hang out around there. It was a place to be. Imagining him having the capacity to sell internet access more easily 
uh, 24 hours a day perhaps, I, I can imagine uh, the, the, the comparison of, of uh, wells being built, wells being built in villages, and how the water the water uh, moves out moves out in various channels from that from that well uh, for profit and altru more altruistically. Similarly, similarly, if a, an internet connection were were set up in a village and allowed to information to be meshed out from that from that central location. Or we might have we might have a, a different kind of example. Perhaps we're not going to go to Morocco, but a place like Bratislava, Slovakia, uh, where we have Daniel who works in his office from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. each week, and his neighbor Julia runs an internet marketing design firm out of her office 500 feet away. And the bulk of her internet usage is during the day, and he never uses the internet during the day. He, he only needs it during the night, and she never needs it at night. Here there's comparable uses, and perhaps there are 20 neighbors who might have a similar use in that area. Now, now there's functionality to this idea that would be uh, attractive. One example might be a public bidding system. Does anyone have any familiarity with cryptocurrency in this room? Raise your hand if you've, cool, few people, few people. I am not trying to social engineer you once again. Who knows Bittrex, uh, Bitfinex, who's heard of Bitfinex? Same people, awesome. Now, when someone's trading stocks or other instruments, there can be a need for the person to have access to instant credit. The same with crypto. You, you might have an opportunity where you need to immediately buy something. And if you're relying on the, let's say the US banking system, can I get a boo for the US banking system? If you're relying on the US banking system, boo, come on, let's hear it, boo, boo. Or maybe you love it. Let's hear, if you love it, let's hear it. Silence, silence, okay. Um, you know, if you're relying on the US banking system, maybe you end up with two to five days waiting for, for money to, to move around, which is incredibly, can be incredibly frustrating dealing with these choke points. Um, and um, in, in crypto, there's, there's kind of some other neat solutions that are arising. In Bitfinex, on Bitfinex, for example, uh, there's a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, credit system on the exchange. So because of the peer-to-peer -peer nature of this marketplace, uh, there's no set official price deemed appropriate by a centralized body. No one is saying credit on the exchange costs this much. The price of money, the price of money is a, another word for interest, is at a moving price on that, that exchange. So when Bitcoin moves quickly or another crypto, it tends to increase the demand for quick money on the exchange. Consequently, the price of money moves up. Again, the price of money is, is uh, interest. And uh, this has the effect of preventing a shortage by incentivizing lenders to enter the marketplace who wouldn't have lent money at a lower rate, which makes perfect sense. Um, and this market dynamic in which individuals lend to individuals has a very powerful role in providing for the needs of the individual in the marketplace and is a smart, decentralized, and arguably old-fashioned method in our era. This is an old-fashioned way to, to, to make sure uh, crypto functions well. This old-fashioned method is simply letting people interact with each other. That's it. And Bitfinex's software allows people to interact with each other. And what is, what's innovative is that it allows a trader, right? It's not just these two gentlemen who've walked in, who know each other already perhaps, allowing them to interact with each other. Bitfinex's software allows, you know, arguably a trader in Nairobi uh, with, with funds to lend on the exchange um, and a trader in Tokyo who might be short funds at a given moment, uh, they're, they're able to, to do business with each other. One is able to lend to another. Um, though those two may have no interaction with each other, uh, though, though those two will never need to know each other, um, it, it, the software allows that, that ability. And for those who've just entered, we, I am, I'm discussing a software that can kind of introduce an, an Airbnb idea to the last mile of internet service, a software that can incentivize someone to provide internet service uh, to retail to retail users. Um, and similar to Bitfinex, our, our internet protocol would, you know, there may be times, there may be times where it may cost uh, one one hundredth of a cent per gigabyte to to uh, purchase to purchase uh, 
on our, on our software. Maybe that's how a provider sets it up. Other times it may cost 10 cents, or maybe it's 20 cents a gigabyte, maybe 40 cents. And maybe you have information that you need so desperately at that moment that you will pay 40 cents at that moment of high traffic. And when the price goes up, it incentivizes more people into that marketplace, more providers into that marketplace. Like Bitfinex, the software is suddenly allowing people who do not have contact with each other to do business with each other, to provide for one another. Another, another aspect uh, of the software that would be ideal is the ability to connect several nodes at once. And for a large data upload, uh, if you could connect not to just one node and be throttled, but connect to 40 nodes perhaps, your, your data upload might quickly, quickly be handled. Um, or if one of the nodes were to go down, you wouldn't have to be too reliant on it. There would be redundancy in the network with a, a quick ability to switch nodes. Another ideal might be a, a calendar system where a user, many users, uh, perhaps a tourist or a business traveler or uh, someone running errands around the city, they might need internet just for a moment or two. Uh, but other users might want some stability. And the idea that, that uh, this gentleman here might, might sell this gentleman here um, a uh, internet, internet provisions for three years or two months to, to ensure some stability, that might be advantageous. This would even invite what, what farmers might do. Farmers, farmers, to protect themselves, they set up an insurance policy. Uh, for, for 5 or 10% of the, the price of their crops, they can set up an insurance policy, uh, commonly known as futures today, a futures contract. And this might invite futures contracts for the, the price of internet. Increasing, increasing the, uh, the, the, the ability for, for low prices to be discovered in all likelihood. Here, very attractive to us, is that this might enable charity, this network. Uh, and at present, a person who believes in free Wi-Fi for all can simply fund and run a wireless router with no password on it. And that person would be sharing their internet with anyone who identifies that open node, and the internet connection could also be shared with a plethora of bad actors, and that individual might be put at risk in a variety of ways at the same time. Um, it might be hard for them to segregate or limit traffic. It might be hard for them to even figure out who is on the internet, which isn't necessary, but perhaps they might want to. I don't know. Um, but it's the hope of the authors of this white paper that it will inspire people who believe in free internet for all not to turn to government for the solution because government has failed us repeatedly on this issue. And I promise you, I promise you, government will continue to fail us on this issue. Our system, we hope, will provide incentive for someone to privately fund charitable gifts of free internet for all. We believe that with our idea, this can finally become a reality. This would bring us tremendous joy. Uh, and that it be done with recognition of how to uh, effectively, effectively uh, do well in a local environment. Um, it's it's a uh, Western gifts of charity to Africa for some time have been derided as being uh, detrimental to a local economy. If the U.S. if the U.S. government suddenly dumps three years worth of corn on the African economy for three years, it will destroy the local farming economy. This is sometimes done with no regard for the local economy. Um, we believe we believe that we can uh, help. Through, through the proper software, we can help charitable giving uh, in local economies of internet service to be done in a way that's more uh, localized and more in line with what the local economy might need, more committed to a local economy. Billing is important for the idea. Um, now, the greatest promise of Micropayment technology exists in the realm of cryptocurrency in areas where KYC laws do not apply. Uh, please raise your hand if you understand the term KYC. Okay, maybe half the room. Uh, when, when you open a bank account, uh, you're asked for your ID, you're asked for uh, your address, you're, you may be asked for quite a bit of information depending on what jurisdiction you open that bank account in. Um, this is a know your customer. KYC is a know your customer law. Um, now, the, the Know Your Customer laws, they put a considerable amount of compliance, legal, regulatory um, 
overhead onto payments. And this is this is it, it's been estimated. It's been estimated that uh, a PayPal transaction. So a PayPal transaction is free. It's it's virtually free uh, for me to for me to give any of you guys money by PayPal. PayPal is really a tremendous system. PayPal could be used to to beat cryptocurrency many times over in cryptocurrency's current state. Except PayPal has KYC. PayPal spends an estimated 25 to 30 cents per transaction on KYC. K PayPal duplicates and goes beyond, in some situations, banking laws so that PayPal can, can entirely cut people out of an economy. It's disgusting what PayPal does. Fed up with this enough, uh, a few, a few cypherpunks uh, knowledgeable about economics said maybe there's maybe there's a better solution out there and and we've arrived at uh, Bitcoin we've arrived at Monero we've arrived at at currency that's very hard to censor um, beautifully if we can combine that technology with this idea we arrive at internet that's very hard to censor this inspires me beyond belief that that is possible that we can have internet that is not able to be censored and I believe it can be done with a high level of quality if there's a profit motive involved. Now, as the nodes of this network establish a reliable connection and reliable customers, they'll begin to reliably understand their income, their income potential, um, and they'll begin to invest. They'll begin to invest more and more on that potential. There'll be some people who do it as a hobby, some people who do it as a business. Um, and others are going to seek to try to provide a more robust network. The way uh, the, the economy around internet provision has been structured to date is very siloed and prevents a great deal of competition. And I believe this will be a, a method of breaking up that siloing and introducing a great deal of competition. I'd like to thank you so much for, for your time right now. Um, if, if, anyone, if anyone has questions, uh, I'm going to stick around. If anyone has feedback to give me, I'm going to stick around. I'd, I'd really love to hear it. Again, uh, Pete Runyon, who has uh, thought through this with me as well, in the back there, would also love to hear this. Thank you so much for your time. If, if you want, I'd be happy to. Okay, thank you so much, Alan. We have time for about two questions before I proceed. Does anyone have any questions for Al? None? You covered everything during the talk? Okay, one here. Hi, thanks for the talk. So um, I guess I'm trying to connect what you've just presented with your like uh, day job at Kraken. So I'm guessing that it has to do with globalization and seeking out you know coding talent throughout the world, even if they don't happen to have super good internet. Is it Something like that. Uh, so I'm here. I'm here today, totally on my own. Uh, no connection to Kraken. Uh, Kraken has no interest in this project. Um, it is 100% uh, the 100% a, a suggestion that that felt like it fit. It fit this uh, venue. Um, but I can talk more. Anyone want to talk about uh, becoming a developer at Kraken or local talent at Kraken? Like I'll talk about that all day too, because. I think we're going to do really awesome things, and we're looking for people to be on the team. Excellent. One more? One over here. Thank you. I enjoyed your talk. Um, I was thinking about um, how do you envision you would purchase like parcels of internet? Would it be beforehand, or could you do it like per bit? Or you know, what, what's the right sized lump of internet to buy, I guess is my question. Yeah, this is such a good question. Um, so like, uh, from, from, the 19, from the 1920s to like the 1980s, there was one, cell, one, one uh, telephone provider in the United States that was allowed effectively. It was AT&T, there were some, that's not 100% true, but it's almost totally true, where you only had one, one option. And you would have the Harvard economists, and you would have uh, the, the PhDs on the news, and the government PhDs, and they would, say, they would say, 
there's only one way to, to do any utility. It's natural monopoly theory. And they would teach it in colleges. And they would say, there's no room for competition in here. You're going to destroy an industry if you even try to introduce competition. This is insane. And the people who believed in a marketplace who said, hey, there's these, all these other times where a marketplace functioned, and it really benefited the consumer. It really benefited society, arguably. And the, the, the PhDs would say, you're going to destroy everything. And the, the person arguing for, for a marketplace would, would say, you know, would have no real answer of how that marketplace might look like. It's impossible to know. And they would say, what, you want three telephone lines down every street? You want three buttons on every phone? You're going to make our neighborhoods look ugly. Well, I don't know. Maybe it will be three telephone lines down every, down every street. Um, once, once, that, once that monopoly came to an end, you know, it was almost 40 years of everyone in the same, every household in the U.S. practically had the same telephone, right? You, had, you, had, you could have black, you could have cream, you could have uh, like this pinkish color, but almost everyone had the exact same technology. And if you connected some technology that you bought in Japan, the phone company might fine you for, for uh, uh, trying to ruin the phone lines. So like there was tremendous pushback about any little inkling of competition. That's like 40 years of American technology. Then you end up, you end up it took 27 years to go from, to go from end of monopoly to viable supercomputer in your pocket, marketplace uh, profit-making supercomputer in your pocket with the iPhone in 2007. And this is a, a true testament to what the marketplace can accomplish if it's just allowed, if, if all that happens is for consumer you and entrepreneur you to be able to interact with each other in the marketplace, though you may never have met each other before. This is beautiful. So you asked me a question that I have no answer to. and I. The important thing, the important thing is that the marketplace will solve this. And I, I bet I bet there's gonna be ten people doing one thing and ten people doing another and it being figured out. And importantly, importantly, when you hear people speak about Monero today, Monero is a great example because it's become the boogeyman of cryptocurrency. That's where all the bad criminals have gone to now. When you hear people speaking about this, you will notice you will notice the the PhDs from Harvard. The government PhDs saying the exact same thing they said in the 70s, saying there's no room for competition. If you introduce competition to national currencies, you're going to ruin it all. And it sounds real familiar to me. And I know what happens. I know what happens 27 years after you introduce that competition. You don't even recognize what the future looks like. It's beautiful. Thank you for your question so much. All right, let's give another hand for Alan again. Thank you.